that you can be seated. Open up your Bibles to Matthew. Matthew, we're going to be here a couple times uh, in Matthew. You can open up to Matthew chapter 7. This is the verse that we've talked about. We're looking at separation throughout church history. I've given you this phrase, and we'll continue to, that separation is the logical conclusion of understanding the importance of doctrinal purity. If you understand that God's word says something, and you're willing, and you're going to what we what we just sang, uh, that my heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. If you understand that God's word says something, and you have have determined uh, within your heart to base your life upon the doctrines of God's word, then when people go and they take errant doctrines, they they adopt doctrines that are not in God's word. The the only logical thing to do is to separate from those who, de who depart from God's word. We've been using this graphic to visualize Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14, which are turned to there in your Bibles. It says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. If we're walking in truth, and truth is defined how? Oh, you can do better than that. How is truth defined? God's word, right? John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth, okay? If we're walking in truth as defined by God's word, then we have a duty to try to reach those who are on this road. Okay? If, if I'm in the truth and I know of someone who is lost in one of these many, many, uh, th this is not even a tenth of the lanes on the road to destruction. Okay? This, I couldn't fit all of them on the screen for sure, all of the different ideas that men follow. But if I have truth, and, and truth is defined not because, well, I'm, I'm Ben Linville and I'm Pastor Ben Fennett Bible Church, so, so you should listen to me. No, no, no. <laughs> Truth is defined by God's word. So if I'm standing with God's word, then I can know that I'm right. If I if I say, well, you know what? I just I just feel like this is this is right. Well, now we've entered a whole other dimension. Because my feelings and your feelings hold equal weight. But all of our feelings combined don't change what God's word says. We're duty bound to stay by God's word. So if I'm Walking in the truth that God has laid out for us, and we look and we see many who are on this road, we are to separate from them, but, but should we try to reach them? Sure. Absolutely, right? I should, I should try to reach them with the gospel, but I can't go join them on their road. My, my influence needs to go one way. My influence is I'm trying to reach this person for Christ. I'm not joining arms with them in a common cause. Rather, I'm trying to reach this person with the, with the true gospel. <clears throat> Just by way of review, we talked about this last week a little bit. Some people would say, well, but love covers a multitude of sins. Well, to, to apply that to doctrinal error is to misapply scripture. For me to say, well... I know, they don't, I know they don't believe in the substitutionary atonement of Christ. They don't believe in the virgin birth, and they're a little shaky on the resurrection. But I love them enough that I'm willing to overlook those things. What do you think of that? Wrong. Wrong. Why is that wrong? It's not God's word. <laughs> because it's not God's word. Because the Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate. I'm not allowed to say, well, I love that person enough to overlook their doctrinal errors, link arms with them in a common cause, and we're going we're gonna to move forward to get... No, we can't do that. My love for that person should cause me to try to reach them with the gospel. But it can't cause me to say, well, you know what, I'm willing to overlook the, the insignificant doctrines. What is an insignificant doctrine? If God's word said it, then we need to abide by it. I gave you this quote from Ernest Pickering. He said, no amount of appeals to love can be a proper basis for disobeying God in an unholy alliance. Love obeys God. Love 
obeys God. That's a good thing to abide by. You, when, when we start talking about love, and it's, it's hard because, you know, we, we look at those lanes and we say, well, you know, I, I do love some people who are on the path to destruction. And I do too. I have people who are, who are, who are going their own way. They're, they're not believers. They're on the broad path to destruction. And I love that person. But that love can't, can't make me say, well, you know what? We're going we're gonna to just erase all of our differences and we're going to join together. Rather, my love should say, I'm, gonna, I'm going to expend every effort to share the love of Jesus Christ with that person. We've talked about a group of people called the Donatists. They, called, they followed a man whose name was Donatus. Okay, remember, uh, to be called by the name of a man does not mean that you worship the man, but merely that you follow his teachings in most cases. The people called the Donatists believed in separation, and they placed a premium upon purity within the church. If you went into apostasy, and then the, the, the winds of culture change, and it becomes the popular thing to be in church and to, to, to do Christian things, you can't, you can't return from apostasy without repentance. You don't get to, to change allegiances. That, that's not the way that it works. And the Donatists were, were big on purity within the church. The Catholics selected a champion to go against Donatus. His name, we gave it to you last week, Augustine, who was the bishop of Hippo. Hippo was in North Africa. And so Augustine was one of those. He was the champion who the Catholics selected to bring these separatists under the umbrella of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is, they're masters of syncretism. They're masters of, of just kind of absorbing other religions into themselves, and that's what they want to do to the Donatists. But the Donatists will not be absorbed. They say, no, we will not join with you because doctrine matters. Augustine's cry, his rallying cry, was not the truth. It wasn't holy living, but rather... He appealed to these things. He appealed to tradition. He appealed to custom. He appealed to testimony. And he appealed to love. Well, if you love Jesus, and we all love Jesus, right? Was the, the appeal. If you love Jesus, and we all love Jesus, then you'll join with us. Is that, is that true? No. If you love Jesus, what will you do? Okay. If you love me... Keep my commandments. And his commandments are to separate from those who go into errant doctrine. Schaff, who wrote a very long church history, summarizes the issue between the Donatists and the Catholics this way. He said, the Donatist controversy was a conflict between separatism and Catholicism. Between the idea of the church as an exclusive community of regenerate saints and the idea of the church as the general Christendom of state and people. We talked about this last week. Which one of these is biblical? The church as an exclusive community of regenerate saints? Or the church as the general Christendom of state and people? Which one's right? Exclusive. And that sounds terrible, doesn't it? Say, well, well, we want to be inclusive. Well, well God doesn't. God says that narrow is the way. There's only the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him through Jesus Christ. And so the exclusive community of regenerate saints is important. This, if you say, well, I'm a Christian. Well, tell me about how you got saved. Well, I was born in America. Wait, what? Well, America's a Christian nation. And so I'm a Christian because I was born in, in, in America. That's what the Catholics were pulling for, kind of a general Christendom of the state. Matthew 7, 13, which we've looked at, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and narrow is the way which leadeth to life. Another quote for you. The same problem has recurred over and over again throughout the centuries. Non-separatists, those who are looking to, to broaden the tent, to, to make the umbrella bigger, Non-separatists tend to protect the existing order, find excuses for it, and argue for its purifica purification and continuation, even as it progressively grows worse. Separatists, on the other hand, desire the establishment, a 
of new and fresh witnesses to God's word. There does come a point where you have to say, this organization, this individual, this conference, or whatever it is, this, they have made their choice to go into error, and I will not go with them. I'm going to separate. I can't walk with you. Can two walk together except they be agreed? What's the, what's the answer? No. no, two can't walk together unless they're agreed. And so we come to, how many of you are familiar with the, the illustration of the carrot and the stick? You're familiar with this? It looks like this, a picture of it. You, when you want to get your mule or whatever it is to keep going in the right direction, they would take a stick and they would tie it on a string and hang it in front of the mule. I don't know if this works. Anybody know? Does it work? Sounds like it would. So they would hang the, the carrot out in front and the mule is always going towards the carrot. The carrot is something attractive that they hope will make the donkey or whatever it is keep going in the right direction. But what if the donkey won't go after the carrot? Well, then you give them the stick, right? That you, you, you take the carrot off the stick and you beat the donkey with it, right? Until it minds and does what you want it to. Well, that's what happened. Augustine tried to use the carrot of love to draw in these these early separatists into unity with the Catholics. And when that didn't work, we'll give them the stick. If they won't join for love, if they won't join because of tradition and because of custom, then we'll, we'll force them to join. We'll force people to join us. We won't allow them to separate. The Catholic Church's first great persecution against other Christians, okay, was against the Donatist Free Church. Let me give you, this is one of Augustine's letters. I want you to listen. Look in here for a, a separation of church and state. You're not going to find it. Here's what he says. Why then should the church not compel her lost sons to return if the lost sons have compelled others to be lost? It is, is it not part of the shepherd's care when he has found those sheep which have not been rudely snatched away but have been gently coaxed and led astray from the flock and have begun to be claimed by others to call them back to the Lord's sheepfold by threats or by pain of blows if they try to resist. As the Donatists claim, they ought not to be forced into the good, and the church imitates her Lord in forcing them. Do you follow what he's saying there? <laughs> That's not good. So here's what happens. Barry decides, you know what? had enough of this church thing, I'm done. Just, I'm just, just going to walk away. And so Barry walks away. What should I do for Barry? Galatians says, <coughs> when a brother is overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one. I should go and I should talk to Barry. Okay, So I go and I talk to Barry. I say, Barry, we really want you back. We want you to come back into the into good fellowship with the church. Barry, we're praying for you. He says, no, nope, not interested. Don't, don't have any interest in that. Barry, I'm praying for you. Okay. Now, Barry, a, a few weeks go past. Barry, Barry's not coming back into the, into the fold. So what, what should I do? Well, I'm going to get my shotgun out. I'm going to go over to Barry's house. I'm going to kick his front door in. I'm going to say, Barry, I'm going to expect you in your seat on Sunday, or there's going to be problems. What, what do you think? Sound good? Well, what if it works? What if Barry's in his seat on Sunday? Is it okay? Why is it not okay? He was changed against his will is of the same opinion still. Yeah, he that's changed against his will is of the same opinion still. Would Barry have been here without the shotgun? No, no. Force doesn't work in matters of faith, does it? Now, they tried this at a few different points, and we're going to talk about it. The Catholic Church was not opposed to. They show up, they've got a big group of people, and they say, will you be accept, will, will you take the mass? Will you accept, uh, will, will you join us in our faith? The guy says, no. They cut his head off, and they go to the next person. How about you? Will you well, guess what the next guy does? Yeah, yeah, I'll do, I'll do whatever. But, but that's not what God commands. We, we have, we are blessed by God with a free will. And, and God does not force us into doing right. Have you ever prayed and thought, man, it'd be nice if the Lord would just 
pick that person up by the scruff of the neck, put them where they need to be, and then they can start again. You ever thought that? But God doesn't pick people up by the scruff of the neck and put them where they need to be. Rather, what does he do? Well, as a shepherd, he, he guides them. He guides them to do what they will. I'm talking about the laws. He'll guide them towards himself. He'll convict of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. But the Lord is not going to say, you will get saved, or, or I'll get, put you in a chicken arm. You know what that is? When you twist somebody's arm behind them. Okay, okay, I'll get saved. Fine. That's, that's not how God operates. That's how Augustine operated. That's how the Catholic Church operated. They tried to force people to unify. And, but <clears throat> if a person is truly saved, God does use some things to help correct them. Without question. The Lord chastens those whom he loves and scourges every, what's the next word? Son. But he doesn't deal with the lost the way he deals with Satan. Just like I don't deal with other people's children the way I deal with my children. <laughs> with if my children get out of line, I'm going to grab my child and I'm going to make them get in line because they're my child. But if someone's not my child, I might say, hey, let's, uh, let's, let's not color the wall, shall we? I, I'm going to kind of try to, to guide them, in, but, but I'm not going to force them. Yes, sir? Um, when someone uh, attends this church and then decides, oh, I'd like to be a member of this church, I'd like to see your doctrine. And so we give them one. And then uh, but you go to the uh, to some of these other churches, and say, say the Catholic Church, they say, I'd like to be a member of that. I'd like to see the history of your church and your doctrine. So they cover that all up. I mean, evidently, because I would say 90% of the people have no idea what you just talked about there on that. For sure. On that uh, set of how they were in the past and what they could be in the future. Yeah. And so. Ignorance uh, is bliss, right? Yeah, right. Grows the church. So, so, you know, there are people who say, you guys are trying to work against our church, and we don't like that because we believe that this is about the most holy place that there is on earth. Look at the Pope, you know, and all this and that. And you uh, say look at so the Pope. Kind of, <laughs> <laughs> so they kind of throng. You see hundreds of thousands of them sitting out there. Yeah. But they don't know what you, what you just said. They just they don't have any idea. <laughs> Not one iota of an idea. Yeah, there's, there's been a great cover-up of this element of, of church history. And, and I'm going to get to this. Hold, hold, what, hold what Barry just said. We'll get there in just a second. And I want to share with you just a couple more facts before we get there. The Catholic Church in this time is gaining more and more power to constrain followers because the church and the state become one. Again, if you don't show up to church, they'll send the cops to your house and they'll constrain you to come to church or they'll give you a fine or eventually they'll put you in jail. So the Catholic Church has the overarching religious political force in Europe. As Europe begins to head into what we would call the Dark Ages, and we'll, we'll explain this, the Dark Ages is about a thousand year period. It starts in 500 AD and it goes to about five, uh, 1500 AD. So there's a big portion of history that is shrouded in this shadow. It was during this time that the Catholic Church ruled over particularly Europe the, and the Near East and North Africa with an iron hand. They were masters of syncretism, so they would just absorb other religions into their fold, and many other groups of religious people came under their power. The Donatists, who we've talked about, so I'm not going to go back again and, and repeat all of that, the Donatists survived from when they began in around the second century until around the 400s as a people group, as a, as a specific religious crowd, the Donatists lasted that long. But then their numbers began to decline because of tremendous persecution. Uh, the Catholics started killing them, and so their numbers lessened and lessened until eventually the Donatists uh, they, they kind of ceased to be as, a, as an, a group of people. The name Donatist would resurface years later, and it would start to be used to describe other people who separated. For instance, maybe some names that you're familiar with. Anybody ever hear the name Waldensian or Anabaptist? The, those names, they got put under the heading of Donatists. They were not Donatists, but because the Donatists had been a separatist group, 
these other separatist groups kind of came under that heading. Okay? So let me give you just a couple facts about the nature of church history, and I hope that this will, will turn some lights on for you. The nature of church history. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, this is where Jesus said to Peter, he said, Thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, the church. What church? Which specific church? What was that church called? Was it, in, was it the first independent Bible church? Is that, what, what church are we talking about? God's church. What would be another name for the church that he's talking about here? The body of Christ. The body of Christ, right? The, the body of Christ. I will build my body, and the gates of hell won't prevail against the body. But there are several uh, factors that make any study of church history a little bit difficult. Here's what the Catholics would have you to believe church history looks like. They would say it looks like this, that you have... From the time of Christ, or just after, I put the cross because it, it's a good marking point. So we know that the church started in 32 AD, approximately, on the day of Pentecost, the same year that Christ died. So they would have you to believe that from that time all the way up until the present, we have a solid line where we have, we have who was the first pope, if you're talking to a Catholic? Peter. Peter was married, by the way. Did you know that? Lots of the popes were married. Uh, so you have uh, the, the Catholic Church would say we have a line of secession since Peter. And, and so we have this apostolic secession and the church has just it's gotten stronger. And what Barry was saying, they've killed, multiplied thousands, if not millions of people throughout the centuries. The popes, I'll get into this on a later date if you're interested, the popes have a, a very... Um, sordid past. There are a number of instances where a pope was seceded by his son. What do you think of that? They're supposed to be celibate, but lots of them were seceded by their sons, and many of them had lots and lots of children. If you're interested, I can give you resources that will help you follow that out. So the, the Catholics would have you believe from the time the church began until the present, we have this solid line. The church has just gotten bigger. It's just gotten stronger because Jesus is building the church on Peter. We know that's not the case. Peter was not the rock that Jesus was speaking of. As a religious movement, the Roman Catholic Church was born in error and has maintained its error from its inception shortly after the time of Constantine until the present day. What, what we believe, the truth, has never rested in the Catholic faith. The truth, this is entirely inaccurate. Here's what church history actually looks like. The history of the church is not our following one specific group of people who has survived all throughout time. Rather, we're looking at sound doctrine that has been held since the institution, since the formation of the church, all the way up until the present. And some of the names, we have the apostles. How strong was the church under the apostles? It was strong, right? That the church was moving forward. That's when they hit the first wave of persecution. And rather than being squelched, the church enhanced. The church grew. You come into the Donatists and the Paulicians and, and the Waldensians and the Huguenots and the Anabaptists, and you have all of these different people who, what they did is, over the course of time, from the foundation of the church until the present, God has always had a people. We could call them a remnant if we wanted to use biblical type language. There has always been a group of people that has held to sound doctrine. They have been in many different geographic locations, and they have gone by many different names. And truth be told, if we got down into it, we would disagree with many of these on some of the finer points. But when it comes to salvation by grace through faith alone, when it comes down to the doctrines of Scripture, the foundations of our faith, we can find that God has always had a remnant of people on earth. That's what the study of church history is. 
But church history is a little bit difficult because maybe you've heard the phrase that history is always written by the victors. Have you heard that? You know why you read uh, World War II history the way that you do? Well, because we won. Had the Germans won, you would read it entirely differently because they would have written. And you look at this and you say, but the church, the true church, is going to be victorious. Right? You believe that? Right. But has the true church been victorious yet? No. No. We're, a, we're, a, we're as outcasts. We're a peculiar people. We're few in number. The, the true church. And by true church, I'm not, I'm not speaking pridefully when I say we because we abide by the doctrines of Scripture, not the commandments of men. So, while it is true that the, the true church will be victorious, the church's ultimate victory has not yet been realized. And the Roman Catholic Church considered anyone who disagreed with them or spoke contrary to their, doc their doctrine, their dogma, they considered them to be a heretic. When you're reading in church history, and you're reading in a Roman Catholic type of church history, if you're interested in church history, much of it was written by Catholics, anyone, whenever you read the word heretic, that means someone who disagreed with Rome. Okay? Not necessarily someone who was a legitimate heretic. Real quick, you tell me, what's a heretic? <laughs> Someone who doesn't agree with Rome. What is it? What is an actual heretic, though? If I were to say so and so is a heretic, <laughs> someone who believes in false doctrine. Okay, the Catholic Church says, "Well, heretic is anybody who doesn't agree with us because we hold we hold all of the true doctrine." But an apostate would be someone who may still believe, but is just falling away. An apostate would be someone who had had truth, fell away from it. A heretic would be somebody who maybe never had it and just went all wild into error. But the, some of these folks that you... <coughs> some of these folks that people's names in, they use, are they then, are they then actually um, heretics because they got a fallen so large they thought they were the only true church? Sometimes. Sometimes that happens, yeah. Sometimes you would have a group of people who would start out with right doctrine, and over time they would apostatize. Over time they would go away from right doctrine. And so there would be another group of people who were holding to right doctrine. But God has always had a group of people on planet Earth living and thriving, sometimes thriving under persecution, who have held to the truth. What did the Catholics do with heretics? They killed them. They would, they would butcher them. And if you're interested in doing some of the homework, I, I warn you, it's bloody, but if you read some of the books by John Fox, who wrote Fox's Book of Martyrs, the way that the Catholic Church dealt with heretics was bloody. They would kill them, they would burn them, they would do any number of things. What did the Catholics do with writings of people who they considered to be heretics? They would burn that as well. They would destroy them. Consequently, what we know about many of the groups that I just put their names up in front of you, what we know of them is not from their own writings, but from the writings of those who tried to snuff them out. The Catholics ended up writing uh, the doctrine of, or writing the history of these people uh, because they were not there to write them themselves. Let me read this to you. Here's a quote to kind of prove my point. What these Albigenses, that's a, a group of people who the Catholics disliked, what these Albigenses were, it cannot well be gathered by the old popish histories. For if there were any who did hold, teach, or maintain against the pope, or his papal pride, or withstand or gainsay his beggarly traditions, rites, and religions, etc., the histories of that the historians of that time, in writing of them, do for the most part so deprave and misrepresent them, suppressing the truth of their articles, that they make them and paint them worse than Turks and infidels. So the Catholics, they, they have this group of people they consider to be heretics, so they kill the heretics, they burn all of their writings, and then they write bad things about them in history. And that's the history that we have left, in large part, to go on. Another reason that church history is a little bit difficult, especially when it comes to this period, is because in their own writings, the Catholics would often use labels of their enemies interchangeably. So they would take a, the Donatists were in a particular geographic location. 
And you have another group of people who have similar beliefs, but they're not Donatists, and the Catholics would just put them all under that label. So it makes it a little bit more difficult. Again, God has had a witness. He has faithfully been building his church. The gates of hell have not prevailed against his church. But that witness has not always been the same group of people. Sometimes a group of people starts out right and they go into apostasy. Sometimes a group of people is snuffed out by persecution. The Catholics killed all of them, and so none of them survived. But in spite of all the fury of hell being aimed at the church, God has always had a remnant, though sometimes an exceedingly small one. Let me give you this before we, we move on. Matthew 6, 8, 16, 18, what I gave you, where Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. To prevail against means to overcome, to overpower, to be superior in strength. God has kept that promise. The church, the true church, those who hold to the doctrines of Christ, the true church has never been overcome. They, they've gone through some deep waters. There have been some times when there were few of them, and the few that there were were on the run, but they've never been snuffed out. The, the, the Lord has built his church. Any questions on what we just mentioned before we move on? Well, we've discussed before that it's pretty easy to see where people can believe that Jesus said on Peter he's going to build the church. And it's, and it's easy to see where people could think that Because of the numbers of people that that uh, understand that Peter to be the rock, it's easy to see how the numbers can grow. Because they can quote that verse and say, "Yeah." Scripturally speaking, how would you counsel somebody who came to you and said this? It must be right. Look at how many people believe it. <laughs> well, scripturally speaking, how would you deal with that? Narrow is the way. Narrow is the way. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are lots of people who are wrong. But the Bible says there are few who are right. And few who are right as defined by right itself, by God's word. We don't define right by, well, <laughs> you're right if you stand with me. No, you're right if you stand with God. Just like I'm right if I stand with God. And if I stop standing with God, I've gone wrong. And I'm going to be in, in <laughs> I'm going to face the judgment of God. In view of the, of the number of people on the face of the earth today compared to the number of folks that inhabited the earth back in Jesus' day, that then the, the numbers that follow Christ would be large mm -hmm. comparatively. Well, per capita, maybe, but God, the, the Christ has never had the majority. The, the Christian position has never been the one in the majority. True Christianity. Now, there have been times when there were a lot of people who said, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian, whatever. But I'm talking about those who stand with truth and stand with Scripture. Let me briefly introduce to you, I've already mentioned it just a little bit. The Dark Ages started in 500 A.D., went to about 1500 A.D., so a thousand years they came at the end of a period of time following the fall of the Western Roman Empire. I'm not going to go down into the weeds on this. If you're interested, I can give you some resources. Rome, as it began to fall as an empire divided into two kingdoms, ruled by two different Caesars, sometimes four different Caesars. And then eventually it, one kingdom fell, then the other kingdom fell. As they fell apart, many smaller empires and rulers sprang up in its wake. Politically, the Romans were not on top anymore. Politically speaking, militarily speaking, the Romans weren't on top anymore. But because of the marriage of church and state, of the Catholic Church with the state of whatever country they were in, the Roman Catholic Church lived on in great power to the point where the Catholic Church still held sway over much of Europe. 
by asserting spiritual dominance. They didn't necessarily say, hey, if you don't do what we say, we're going to send our legions because they didn't have legions anymore. Rather, if you don't do what we say, we'll excommunicate you from the church and your, your, your mortal soul will be in peril. This period of time, the Dark Ages, saw the greatest decline in, in economic and cultural, scientific, and intellect that the world has ever seen, that we have on record. During this time, scripture was not available. Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. Nobody had a Bible. No, I shouldn't say nobody. A few people had Bibles. They were very, very rare. If you remember, how many of you remember the name Johannes Gutenberg? He's the man who invented the printing press. And you think, well, that, that works, but the printing press came about in the 1400s. So the Dark Ages start in the 500s, and so you go almost 900 years without the ability to mass produce printed literature. Meaning, if you have a book, it's been handwritten. What would you charge for this if you wrote it by hand? It'd be expensive, wouldn't it? You'd say, boy, that took me, that took me a year and a half. I'm charging a lot of money for it. Books were ridiculously expensive, hand copied. They were rare. But truth be told, the scarcity of books wasn't the main problem. It was only part of the problem. Most of the people, if you handed them a book, they wouldn't be able to read it anyway because illiteracy was at a monumental high during the Dark Ages. Reading and writing was most common among the laity church, the laymen, those, or, uh, among the, the clergy, I'm sorry, among the clergy of the church, meaning, you, you, well, that's, that's father so-and-so, father so-and-so can read, he can read the Bible, so if I want to know what the Bible says, then I need to go and I need to talk to father so-and-so, father so-and-so, he wouldn't lie, would he, he's, he's, after all, he's a great man, you can see how problems would enter, the Bible was in Latin, and the Catholic church prohibited its translation, into the common tongue of the people. And so darkness engulfed Europe, North Africa, and the Near East that was monumental but not complete. God still had a small number of people who maintained true doctrine. They, they had access to Scripture, and they built their lives upon Scripture. Though not all of them could read it, they still they, they had faithful expositors of Scripture, and they built their lives upon the Word of God. There were some other groups who were often looked at as part of the true church history. I'm going to mention two of them, the Albigenses and the Bogomils. We have very limited knowledge about them. The Albigenses were in northern Italy and southern France. They were separate from the Catholic Church, but they had adopted another false doctrine. There was a Persian doctrine that regarded God as a, a force of light and Satan as a force of darkness. And, and those two were just battling for control. So they viewed God not as a person, but as a force. So they went off the tracks. They were separate, but not separate in truth. So if, if you live near the Albigenses and you wanted to, to abide by God's word, not only do you need to separate from the Catholics, you need to separate from them as well, because they've also gone into error. The Catholics persecuted and killed many of the Albigenses. Another group, the Bogomils, they were in Bulgaria. Around 14, or 1140 was when they came. They, they bought into Gnosticism. You remember what Gnosticism is? It's the belief that anything that's fleshly is evil, and only that which is spiritual is good. And that means when it comes to Jesus Christ having a physical body, that, that leads to problems. Because if Jesus didn't have a physical body... And Jesus couldn't shed his blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So these were labeled as heretics and also persecuted by the Catholic Church. Let me just very quickly mention one group to you, a group called the Paulicians. The Paulicians. What's the, what's the main word that you hear in there? Paul. They may have gotten their name from a man, his name was Paul of Samosota, he was the bishop of Antioch in 260, or some believe they got their name from the Apostle Paul. In either case, this was a group of people, the Paulicians, who they were fairly straight in their doctrine. They, they held to the truth. They professed to base their doctrine from the New Testament. Here's, here's what they believed. Admission to the church they held could only be by adult baptism, meaning salvation does not come through baptism. They believe that salvation is a sign 
It's, it's, a, it's a, a mode of identification. They abhorred monasticism. What's monasticism? Anybody know? Monasticism is monks and nuns. The monks, when you see the guy with the little, the little hat, the brown robe, that's monasticism held by the Catholics. They did not accept the intercession of the saints or the kind of honors paid by the Orthodox to Mary. Sounds pretty good so far, doesn't it? They repudiated the use of images, crosses, relics, incense, and candles. A group of people who lined their doctrine from God's word rather than from the Roman Catholic Church. The Paulicians had churches spanning from the Euphrates River up into Asia Minor. So here you have the, the Euphrates River over here uh, on the right side of the map. Asia Minor is this, this portion, we would call it modern day Turkey. And they had churches, they had a leader whose name was Constantine, who was not related at all to the Emperor Constantine, who spread churches starting at the Euphrates and going all the way up into Asia Minor. So they have lots of churches where they begin spreading. The Paulicians were known as an evangelical, anti-hierarchical sect. That's a hard word to say, but what, what does evangelical mean? Evangelist, meaning what? Meaning I've got truth and I'm going to tell you that's evangelical. Okay, That's what it means in its true sense. It's been misused some today. They were anti-hierarchical, okay? meaning that they don't believe in all of the church structure of the, of the pope and priests and bishops and all of this. They believe that the only hierarchy that we are under is the hierarchy of God. Once again, because of their unwillingness to join with the Catholic Church, the Paulicians came under persecution. Empress Theodora the Byzantines and the Roman Catholic Church worked hand in hand from 842 to 857 AD and they butchered 100,000 Paulicians. Now, if they got 100,000, that tells us a little bit about their effect. They were able to share the truth with many who joined and, and were willing to go to the state or to be burned or to be whatever it is for their faith. So, again, a, a small remnant, relatively, but a remnant that survives. A study of church history makes me thankful that Jesus took it upon himself to build the church. It's not on me, it's not on you, it's on Christ. He uses us, but ultimately it falls to him to, in, to, to ensure that the church continues. We just mentioned it briefly, but as we, as we close out Sunday School, we're not properly thankful for what we have. Mm -hmm. I've got God's word in my language. You've got God's word in your language. Our memory verse for the previous two weeks has been Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Isaiah 48 says, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful that you have the ability to read, that you have God's word to read? We're not properly thankful for that, I'm convinced. During Jesus' earthly ministry, there came a point of such division spiritually that many of those who claimed to be his disciples walked away from him. When this happened, Jesus looked at the apostles and he said in John 6, 67, Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Peter answered him, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. I would make the case to you, we also have the words of eternal life, preserved for us in, in written form. And they're worth separating over. Truth be told, this is worth dying over. And many, many, again, multiplied hundreds of thousands, if not millions, <coughs> have shed their blood as a result of holding by and being willing to separate over truth. Let's bow for a word of prayer here this morning. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. Lord, this morning, a little bit different of a, of a time as we've looked more at, at the history of, of what has happened over the years. Lord, I pray that we would, that we would take to heart what you say about truth and the need at times 
to separate. Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to be gracious, to be loving, but Lord, to be unapologetic in our faith. Lord, as we continue to look at church history, I pray that we would take encouragement from those brothers and sisters of years gone by who stood faithful, even at great personal cost. I pray that you'd guide our time the rest of this morning. Be with our hearts as we prepare for the main service. In Jesus' name.